With Diaco, Frozen, a brand known for their history of resin printers, is stepping into the world of FDM printing. On paper, it's a Corex Y printer with 300mm cube build volume, acceleration up to 40k, a flow rate of 50 cubic millimeters, open source firmware, and all of that at a surprisingly attractive price. That's a pretty high bar Frozen set for themselves, and honestly, they delivered a package that I really enjoyed testing, even if it didn't quite live up to all of their marketing promises. So, how good is the Arco really? Well, let's find out. Hey and welcome back to my channel. I'm Matt, the printing nerd, and today I want to talk a bit about my experience with the Frozen Arco. While you're watching me unboxing the printer, let's talk about my first impressions. Because honestly, this thing made quite an entrance. The first thing that caught my eye was the frame. It is heavy, or maybe I should say massively oversized. We're talking about the combination of 20 times 50 aluminium extrusions paired with 65 times 65 mm corner blocks. That's utterly insane. For context, even high-speed printers like the VZBot only uses 2040 extrusions and even the chunky machines like the Doom Cubes uses only 4040 corners. So this thing, it's a tank. And I mean that in the best possible way. The printer comes pre-assembled, but Frozen also sent over their Penta Shield. That's their fancy name for their enclosure add-on. For sake of transparency, Frozen provided me with the Arco and all the accessories you see here free of charge for this review. But as always, my opinions are my own, no scripts, no guidelines, no influence, just my honest take. So the Penta Shield. What really stood out to me was the manufacturing quality. When I lined up the panels, there wasn't even half a millimeter of play. Everything just snapped together perfectly. No wiggling, no bending, just top-notch machining. And once everything was installed, I'm pretty sure it made the frame even more rigid than before. Once everything was assembled, I powered on the printer and went through the initial setup. Gave it a name, connected it to Wi-Fi, pretty straightforward stuff. After that, the printer ran its initial calibration, performing a few sensor checks, the first homing, an input shaper calibration and a bed mesh. And let me tell you, all the rigidity really pays off. You can literally tap the table next to the printer while the input shaper measurement is running and you barely feel a thing. Just tiny hints of vibration, almost nothing. It's wild. Other printers make your desk shake like a washing machine. This one just hums. 20 minutes later, everything was calibrated and the printer was ready for its first print. Besides the Penta Shield, Frozen also sent over their Chroma Kit, their own take on an AMS style filament changer. It supports up to four colors and includes a built in filament dryer that can heat up up to 70 degrees Celsius. In my opinion, combining a filament changer and a dryer in one unit is pretty clever. So I was really excited to see it in action. But before I could do that, I had to print the Chroma Kit spool cover, which Frozen recommends because it keeps the filament in place and helps to ensure smoother, more reliable filament changes. It's also a great print to test the Arcus out of the box performance, since it fills the entire build area it's tall enough to reveal C artifacts and has large, flat surfaces where acceleration artifacts become really visible. So I downloaded their Orca Slicer derivative, Frozen Orca, which automatically detected the printer on my network. I selected their 0.2mm standard profile and after just a few seconds the file was uploaded and the print job started. The homing routine was pretty straightforward. After homing X and Y, the printer heats up the nozzle and the bed and performs a nozzle cleanup routine. After that, it lowers the nozzle temperature to around 140 degrees Celsius 
which helps prevent oozing during the next steps. That's important because Frozen uses a nozzle-based sea leveling system that requires a clean nozzle. Once C is leveled, the printer performs an 8x8 bed mesh. That actually surprised me. I expected a C tilt or quad gantry leveling, but the developers at Frozen decided not to include that. And after digging into the printer's configuration, I can confirm it only uses two C stepper motors. Normally, that would be a bit of a bummer, but I have to say, the print bed and the gantry on my unit are incredibly straight. I measured a deviation of just 0.12 mm across the entire bed mesh, which honestly impressed me, especially considering it achieved that without any C-tilt correction. But let's get back to the print. The first layer came out perfect and stayed perfect on every single print I made over the last two weeks I tested this machine. No scratches, no lifting, no inconsistencies. I have to say, this is the best C-axis I ever tested on an off-the-shelf printer. Good job, Frozen! Once the first layer is done, the printer starts flying. Sure, for those who are used to T250 speeds, it's not mind-blowing. But for an off-the-shelf printer, it's pretty solid. But what surprised me the most was the overall noise levels. The motors are quiet, the linear rails run smoothly, and with the front door closed, even the part cooling fans are barely noticeable. So overall, really good performance up to that point. So let's skip forward and take a look at the final results. Whew. <laughs> Where do I even start? Well, the part doesn't look great. Um, there are all kinds of artifacts on the print um, at first glance. Um, I already spotted some acceleration artifacts all over the screw holes and there are belt artifacts scattered all over the surface. So yeah, that's not good for a printer in this class. But to be fair, there are also good aspects about that print. What I don't see are any VFA patterns from the motors and the first layer looks absolutely perfect. There are also no signs of under extrusion and even the top layers and the corners look great. So the slicer profiles Frozen provided us are clearly well tuned. But what really stands out to me was the layer consistency. I don't know if it's visible on camera, but in real life the layers are perfectly stacked. No single hint of C wobbling or XY inaccuracy. So while this print left me with mixed feelings, I wanted to dig a bit deeper and find out what actually causes those artifacts. So I inspected the gantry and I couldn't believe my eyes. The Y beam is an engineer's wildest dream. They took a massive block of aluminium and they CNC milled it into a U-shape just to integrate the linear rail inside it. That's crazy. But it doesn't stop here. On the underside, they even milled out pockets to reduce the weight of the Y-beam. <laughs> Man, that's, that's something else. Back when I worked in industry, if I had asked my project manager to greenlight something like this, he probably would have punched me in the face. It's that over the top. You need a 5-axis mill and not a small one either. The gantry of this printer is huge, so the tools required to manufacture it at this level aren't just expensive, it's an absolute madness. But also, it's not the source of our artifacts. So let's move on. As soon as I looked at the XY joiners, I found the printer's first weak spot, the idlers. The devs decided to use an inverted Core XY belt path, which is great. It reduces the number of toothed idlers to just two, but those two are absolutely critical. Without them, the belt pattern transfer directly onto the print surface. For some reason though, Frozen decided to use smooth idlers here, which are the main source for the massive belt artifacts we've seen before. I'd really love to see toothed idlers on the whole gantry. They are only slightly more expensive, 
but they would massively improve the printer's overall printing quality and in my opinion they are a must have. Ok, now that we found the source of the belt artifacts, let's dig a bit deeper into the acceleration artifacts. The cool thing about the Arco is that it runs Clipper with Fluid as web interface, so I was able to assess it over the network and run a manual input shaper test to see what kind of resonance compensation it actually doing. The calibration showed over 27k on the x-axis, but with over 10% of vibration. That's quite high, and yet the firmware defaults to a ZV shaper, which honestly isn't ideal here. And it's most likely the reason for the vibration artifacts we saw earlier. Switching to a MZV would cut those down significantly. On the y-axis though, I was surprised. Really? Only 8k? What? Yeah. So I inspected the gantry again and realized that the X-beam is made from a 10x20mm solid aluminum bar. That's tiny compared to the rest of the machine. It's just under-engineered when you compare it to the masterpiece of the Y-axis. Honestly, when I looked at the gantry as a whole, it reminds me of our early prototype stages. Chunky parts that are good enough for a first test, but meant to be replaced later with more refined designs. It kinda feels like that refined stage got skipped here. Maybe due to release deadlines or production pressure, I don't know, it's just an educated guess. If they had simply doubled the thickness of the X-beam, the gantry could easily handle 10, maybe 15k of acceleration overall or even higher with a refined U-shaped version similar to the Y-axis. But as it stands right now, the printer is clearly limited by its X-axis rigidity and it's quite a bit away from their marketing claims. So I thought for a while about how to move on. For me, it would be a quick fix to force MZV on the X-axis and maybe 15 minutes of work to swap the idlers for toothed ones. But I decided against it. Most of this printer's target group might be not as experienced as I am and I don't want to distort my results. So I keep it stock for now. And maybe I do a second video later where I actually mod this thing. If you like to see that, let me know in the comments. So it was time for my first multicolor print. For the test, I went with a multicolor banshee. I've used the pre-sliced G-code file that came with the chroma kit. During filament changes, the printer paused twice with a filament timeout error. At first I thought maybe it's because I skipped some part of the initial chroma kit setup, so I reinserted the filament, resumed the print and in the end it actually finished. I was pretty impressed honestly. I didn't expect the printer to recover after multiple timeout errors like that. The error handling system is surprisingly robust. It never crashed, never lost the print, it just kept going. Now let's have a look at the printed Banshee. The results were surprisingly good. The part cooling on point, layer consistency perfect and considering that the Banshee was printed in under 20 minutes, the quality is exceptional. No visible ringing, no wobbling, no strange extrusion artifacts. It really seems like some prints are simply more forgiving when it comes to those early issues we discovered. So I felt like the printer was ready for a more complex multicolor print. I decided to go with this nice looking dragon as a test model. I used Frozen Orca to assign the colors, map the chroma kit spools, sliced everything and hit print. For context, the dragon uses 4 colors, weights about 40 grams and requires roughly 225 filament changes to complete. The slicer estimated about 4.5 hours, which sounds totally fine for the amount of color switching. After the homing routine, the print started. And at first, everything looked promising. The first white layers printed fast and the first filament changes went smoothly. Up to a point where they didn't. Around 35 of those changes failed. Every time that happened, the printer paused for minutes, blinked red and asked for manual help. Sometimes a simple resume worked, sometimes I had to pull and reload the filament manually and sometimes it just magically fixed itself after half an hour of trying. Completely random. I wasn't able to find the cause. I checked the logs afterwards, no clues. Even looking inside the chroma kit code didn't help either. 
The logic behind it is over 15,000 lines of code and it's not exactly easy to analyze. I even sent the log file to Frozen to get feedback but didn't get a response before the video deadline. Since I was in the room while the printer was struggling through the dragon print writing the script for this video, I kept assisting it along the way. And after 9 hours of teamwork it finally finished. It never crashed but it wasted a lot of time. So imagine starting a print overnight and after a couple of color changes it times out. Yeah, that's a problem. In the current state the chroma kit just isn't reliable. And if that's your main goal, I'd say skip the chroma kit for now. However, as a filament dryer it worked great. And as a filament loader it's super convenient. No more manual purging when swapping materials. And another nice feature is auto switching. It detects when a filament runs out and automatically switches to the next spool that's generally handy since you don't have to constantly manage leftovers. So yeah, neat features overall but not enough to justify the price yet. Hopefully this is something that can be fixed through firmware updates and we'll see a properly working chroma kit in the future. Before we get to the final verdict, a quick reminder. Over 80% of you are watching aren't subscribed yet. Subscribing is completely free and it really helps me to stay visible with manufacturers so I can keep getting printers like the Frozen Arcor in for review. So what is my final verdict? Well, to make things simple, let's start by excluding the Chroma Kit. It's just not reliable right now, so I can't recommend it. Well, for the Arco itself, things getting a bit more complicated. This printer feels like two worlds colliding. Genius engineering on the bottom and prototype vibe on the top. It's like the Y-axis team went full NASA while the X-axis team clocked out early on Friday. And that's a shame, because with just a few more months of refinement this could have been next level. The engineer in me is searching for perfection and yeah, he's not happy. But there's also another part of me that really likes this printer. If I had to imagine owning the Arcor as my first 3D printer, I'd honestly be pretty happy with it. Especially because I'm the type of tinkerer who enjoys spending an hour or two tweaking things. So changing the shaper to MZV and swapping in toothed idlers, that's something that makes this printer to my printer and to be honest, in that state that printer can deliver great quality at good speeds. So yeah, the Arco is not a printer for people who want a press print and forget experience. At least not yet. But for tinkerers, engineers and makers who love to mod their machines, this thing has crazy potential. Throw a lightweight tool head on it, change the X beam and you got a machine that could easily compete for a top spot on the BSO leaderboard. 